Scientific racism, sometimes referred to as race biology, is the pseudoscientific belief that empirical evidence exists to support or justify racism, racial discrimination, racial inferiority, or racial superiority. Historically, scientific racist ideas received credence in the scientific community but are no longer considered scientific. Scientific racism employs anthropology, notably physical anthropology, anthropometry, craniometry, and other disciplines or pseudo disciplines, in proposing anthropological topologies supporting the classification of human populations into physically discrete human races, that might be asserted to be superior or inferior. Scientific racism was common during the period from 1600s to the end of World War I. Since the second half of the 20th century, scientific racism has been criticized as obsolete and discredited, yet historically has persistently been used to support or validate racist worldviews, based upon belief in the existence and significance of racial categories and a hierarchy of superior and inferior races. After the end of World War II, scientific racism in theory theory and action was formally denounced, especially in UNESCO's early antiracist statement, The Race Question, 1950. The biological fact of race and the myth of race should be distinguished. For all practical social purposes race is not so much a biological phenomenon as a social myth. The myth of race has created an enormous amount of human and social damage. In recent years, it has taken a heavy toll in human lives, and caused untold suffering. Such biological fact has not reached a consensus as developments in human evolutionary genetics showed that human genetic differences are often gradual. The term scientific racism is generally used pejoratively as applied to more modern theories, as in the Bell Curve. 1994. Critics argue that such works postulate racist conclusions unsupported by available evidence such as a connection between race and intelligence. Publications such as the Mankind Quarterly, founded explicitly as a «race-conscious» journal, are generally regarded as platforms of scientific racism for publishing articles on fringe interpretations of human evolution, intelligence, ethnography, language, mythology, archaeology, and race subjects. Antecedents <inaudible> 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 Enlightenment thinkers During the Age of Enlightenment an era from the 1650s to the 1780s, concepts of monogenism and polygenism became popular, though they would only be systematized epistemologically during the 19th century. Monogenism contends that all races have a single origin, while polygenism is the idea that each race has a separate origin. Until the 18th century, the words «race» and «species» were interchangeable. <laughs> Robert Boyle versus Henri de Boulainvilliers An early scientist who studied race was Robert Boyle (1627–1691), an Anglo-Irish natural philosopher, chemist, physicist, and inventor. Boyle believed in what today is called monogenism, that is, that all races, no matter how diverse, came from the same source, Adam and Eve. He studied reported stories of parents giving birth to different colored albinos, so he concluded that Adam and Eve were originally white and that whites could give birth to different colored races. Theories of Robert Hooke and Isaac Newton about color and light via optical dispersion in physics were also extended by Robert Boyle into discourses of polygenesis, speculating that maybe these differences were due to seminal impressions. However, Boyle's writings mention that at his time, for European eyes, beauty was not measured so much in color, but in stature, comely symmetry of the parts of the body, and good features in the face. Various members of the scientific community rejected his views and described them as disturbing or amusing, 
On the other hand, historian Henri de Boulainvilliers (1658–1722) divided the French as two races: I, the aristocratic French race descended from the invader Germanic Franks, and e, the indigenous Gallo-Roman race the political third estate populace. The Frankish aristocracy dominated the Gauls by innate right of conquest. In his time, Henri de Boulainvilliers, a believer in the «right of conquest», did not understand «race» as biologically immutable, but as a contemporary «racist» cultural construct. His racialist account of French history was not entirely mythical, despite supporting hagiographies and epic poetry, such as the Song of Roland, La Chanson de Roland, c. 12th century. He sought scientific legitimation by basing his racialist distinction on the historical existence of genetically and linguistically distinguished Germanic and Latin speaking peoples in France. His theoretic racialism was distinct from the biologic facts manipulated in 19th century scientific racism, cf. Cultural relativism. <laughs> Lord Kames the Scottish lawyer Henry Home, Lord Kames (1696–1782), was a polygenist. He believed God had created different races on Earth in separate regions. In his 1734 book Sketches on the History of Man, Home claimed that the environment, climate, or state of society could not account for racial differences, so the races must have come from distinct, separate stocks. Carl Linnaeus Carl Linnaeus (1707–1778), the Swedish physician, botanist, and zoologist, modified the established taxonomic bases of binomial nomenclature for fauna and flora, and was a pioneer researcher in biologically defining human race. In Systema Natura (1767), he labeled five varieties of human species. Each one was described as possessing the following physiognomic characteristics, varying by culture and place. The Americanus, red, choleraic, righteous, black, straight, thick hair, stubborn, zealous, free, painting himself with red lines, and regulated by customs. The Europeanus, white, sanguine, brownie, with abundant, long hair, blue eyes, gentle, acute, inventive, covered with close vestments, and governed by laws. The Asiaticus, yellow, melancholic, stiff, black hair, dark eyes, severe, haughty, greedy, covered with loose clothing, and ruled by opinions. The offer or Africanus, black, phlegmatic, relaxed, black, frizzled hair, silky skin, flat nose, tumid lips, females without shame, mammary glands give milk abundantly, crafty, sly, lazy, cunning, lustful, careless, anoints himself with grease, and governed by caprice. The monstrosus were mythologic humans which didn't appear in the first editions of Systema Natura. The subspecies included the four footed, mute, hairy. Homo feralis, feral man, the animal reared Juvenis lupinus hessensis, Hessian wolf boy, the Juvenis Hanoveranus, Hanoverian boy, the Puella campanica, wild girl of Champagne, and the agile but faint-hearted Homo monstrosus, monstrous man, the Patagonian giant, the dwarf of the Alps, and the monorchid Koikoi, Hottentot, in Amoenitates Academicae, 1763. Linnaeus presented the mythologic Homo anthropomorpha, anthropomorphic man, human creatures, such as the troglodyte, the satyr, the hydra, and the phoenix, incorrectly identified as simian creatures, there are disagreements about what was the basis for Linnaeus' human taxa. On the one hand, the harshest critics say that the classification not only was ethnocentric but seemed to be based upon skin color. On the other hand, Quinton 2010 points out that some authors believe the classification was based upon geographical distribution, being cartographically based, and not hierarchical. Paleontologist Stephen J. Gould 1994 argues that the taxa was "...not in the ranked order favored by most Europeans in the racist tradition." 
and that Linnaeus' division was influenced by the medical theory of humors which said that a person's temperament may be related to biological fluids. In the opinion of Kenneth A. R. Kennedy 1976, Linnaeus certainly considered his own culture better, but his motives for classification of human varieties were not race-centered. The Linnaean Society of London has stated that in Linnaeus' view, European superiority resides in culture, and that the decisive factor in Linnaeus' taxa was culture, not race. Thus, regarding this topic, they consider Linnaeus' view as merely Eurocentric, arguing that Linnaeus never called for racist action, and did not use the word race, which was only introduced later by his French opponent Buffon. Quote, dot. Scholar Stanley A. Rice agrees that Linnaeus' classification was not meant to imply a hierarchy of humanness or superiority, although modern critics see that his classification was obviously stereotyped, and erroneous for having included anthropological, non-biological features such as customs or traditions. John Hunter John Hunter (1728–1793), a Scottish surgeon, said that originally the Negroid race was white at birth. He thought that over time, because of the sun, the people turned dark-skinned or black. Hunter also said that blisters and burns would likely turn white on a Negro, which he believed was evidence that their ancestors were originally white. Topic. Charles White Charles White (1728–1813), an English physician and surgeon, believed that races occupied different stations in the great chain of being, and he tried to scientifically prove that human races have distinct origins from each other. He believed that whites and negroes were two different species. White was a believer in polygyny, the idea that different races had been created separately. His account of the regular gradation in man 1799 provided an empirical basis for this idea. White defended the theory of polygyny by rebutting French naturalist Georges-Louis Leclerc Comte de Buffon's interfertility argument, which said that only the same species can interbreed. White pointed to species hybrids such as foxes, wolves, and jackals, which were separate groups that were still able to interbreed. For White, each race was a separate species, divinely created for its own geographical region. <laughs> Buffon and Blumenbach the French naturalist Georges Louis Leclerc, Comte de Buffon (1707–1788), and the German anatomist Johann Blumenbach (1752–1840) were believers in monogenism, the concept that all races have a single origin. They also believed in the degeneration theory of racial origins. They both said that Adam and Eve were Caucasian and that other races came about by degeneration from environmental factors, such as the sun and poor dieting. They believed that the degeneration could be reversed if proper environmental control was taken, and that all contemporary forms of man could revert to the original Caucasian race. They thought Negroid pigmentation arose because of the heat of the tropical sun. They suggested cold wind caused the tawny color of the Eskimos. They thought the Chinese relatively fair-skinned compared to the other Asian stocks because they kept mostly in towns and were protected from environmental factors. Buffon said that food and the mode of living could make races degenerate and differentiate them from the original Caucasian race. According to Blumenbach, there are five races, all belonging to a single species, Caucasian, Mongolian, Ethiopian, American, and Malay. Blumenbach said. I have allotted the first place to the Caucasian for the reasons given below which make me esteem it the primeval one." Buffon believed humanity was only 6,000 years old the time since Adam. 
Many scientific racialists pointed out at the time that it would have been difficult for races to change so markedly in genotype and phenotype in such a short period of time. Believing in monogenism, Buffon thought that skin color could change in a single lifetime, depending on the conditions of climate and diet. <inaudible> Benjamin Rush Benjamin Rush a founding father of the United States and a physician, proposed that being black was a hereditary skin disease, which he called negroidism, and that it could be cured. Rush believed non-whites were really white underneath but they were stricken with a non-contagious form of leprosy which darkened their skin color. Rush drew the conclusion that, "...whites should not tyrannize over blacks, for their disease should entitle them to a double portion of humanity." However, by the same token, whites should not intermarry with them, for this would tend to infect posterity with the disorder. Attempts must be made to cure the disease. <laughs> Christoph Miners Christoph Miners was a German polygenist and believed that each race had a separate origin. Miner studied the physical, mental and moral characteristics of each race, and built a race hierarchy based on his findings. Miners split mankind into two divisions, which he labeled the "...beautiful white race," and the "...ugly black race." In Miners's book The Outline of History of Mankind, he said that a main characteristic of race is either beauty or ugliness. He thought only the white race to be beautiful. He considered ugly races to be inferior, immoral and animal-like. He said that the dark, ugly peoples were distinct from the white, beautiful peoples by their sad lack of virtue and their terrible vices. According to Miners, the more intelligent and noble people are by nature, the more adaptable, sensitive, delicate, and soft is their body, on the other hand, the less they possess the capacity and disposition towards virtue, the more they lack adaptability, and not only that, but the less sensitive are their bodies, the more can they tolerate extreme pain or the rapid alteration of heat and cold, when they are exposed to illnesses, the more rapid their recovery from wounds that would be fatal for more sensitive peoples, and the more they can partake of the worst and most indigestible foods without noticeable ill effects. Miners said the Negro felt less pain than any other race and lacked in emotions. Miners wrote that the Negro had thick nerves and thus was not sensitive like the other races. He went as far as to say that the Negro has no human, barely any animal, feeling. He described a story where a Negro was condemned to death by being burned alive. Halfway through the burning, the Negro asked to smoke a pipe and smoked it like nothing was happening while he continued to be burned alive. Miners studied the anatomy of the Negro and came to the conclusion that Negroes have bigger teeth and jaws than any other race, as Negroes are all carnivores. Miners claimed the skull of the Negro was larger but the brain of the Negro was smaller than any other race. Miners claimed the Negro was the most unhealthy race on earth because of its poor diet, mode of living and lack of morals. Miners also claimed the Americans were an inferior stock of people. He said they could not adapt to different climates, types of food, or modes of life, and that when exposed to such new conditions, they lapse into a deadly melancholy." Miners studied the diet of the Americans and said they fed off any kind of "...foul offal." He thought they consumed very much alcohol. He believed their skulls were so thick that the blades of Spanish swords shattered on them. Miners also claimed the skin of an American is thicker than that of an ox. Miners wrote that the noblest race was the Celts. They were able to conquer various parts of the world, they were more sensitive to heat and cold, and their delicacy is shown by the way they are selective about what they eat. Miners claimed that Slavs are an inferior race, less sensitive and content with eating rough food. He described stories of Slavs allegedly eating poisonous fungi without coming to any harm. 
He claimed that their medical techniques were also backward. He used as an example their heating sick people in ovens, then making them roll in the snow. In Miners's large work entitled Researches on the Variations in Human Nature, 1815, he studied also the sexology of each race. He claimed that the African Negroids have unduly strong and perverted sex drives, whilst only the white Europeans have it just right. Topic. Later thinkers Topic Thomas Jefferson Thomas Jefferson was an American politician, scientist, and slave owner. His contributions to scientific racism have been noted by many historians, scientists and scholars. According to an article published in the McGill Journal of Medicine, one of the most influential pre-Darwinian racial theorists, Jefferson's call for science to determine the obvious inferiority of African Americans is an extremely important stage in the evolution of scientific racism. The historian Paul Finkelman described Jefferson in the New York Times as follows: A scientist, Jefferson nevertheless speculated that blackness might come from the color of the blood, and concluded that blacks were inferior to the whites in the endowments of body and mind in his notes on the state of virginia jefferson described black people as follows they seem to require less sleep a black after hard labor through the day will be induced by the slightest amusements to sit up till midnight or later though knowing he must be out with the first dawn of the morning they are at least as brave and more adventuresome but this may perhaps proceed from a want of forethought, which prevents their seeing a danger till it be present. When present, they do not go through it with more coolness or steadiness than the whites. They are more ardent after their female, but love seems with them to be more an eager desire, than a tender delicate mixture of sentiment and sensation. Their griefs are transient. Those numberless afflictions, which render it doubtful whether heaven has given life to us in mercy or in wrath, are less felt, and sooner forgotten with them. In general, their existence appears to participate more of sensation than reflection. Comparing them by their faculties of memory, reason, and imagination, it appears to me, that in memory they are equal to the whites, in reason much inferior, as I think one black could scarcely be found capable of tracing and comprehending the investigations of Euclid, and that in imagination they are dull, tasteless, and anomalous. I advance it therefore as a suspicion only, that the blacks, whether originally a distinct race, or made distinct by time and circumstances, are inferior to the whites in the endowments both of body and mind. However, by 1791, Jefferson had to reassess his earlier suspicions of whether blacks were capable of intelligence when he was presented with a letter and almanac from Benjamin Banneke, an educated black mathematician. Delighted to have discovered scientific proof for the existence of black intelligence, Jefferson wrote to Banneke, Nobody wishes more than I do to see such proofs as you exhibit, that nature has given to our black brethren, talents equal to those of the other colors of men, and that the appearance of a want of them is owing merely to the degraded condition of their existence both in Africa and America. I can add with truth that no body wishes more ardently to see a good system commenced for raising the condition both of their body and mind to what it ought to be, as fast as the imbecility of their present existence, and other circumstance which cannot be neglected, will admit. <laughs> Samuel Stanhope Smith Samuel Stanhope Smith was an American Presbyterian minister and author of Essay on the Causes of Variety of Complexion and Figure in the Human Species in 1787. Smith claimed that Negro pigmentation was nothing more than a huge freckle that covered the whole body as a result of an oversupply of bile, which was caused by tropical climates. Topic. Georges Cuvier Racial Studies by Georges Cuvier (1769–1832), the French naturalist and zoologist, influenced scientific polygenism and scientific racism. 
Cuvier believed there were three distinct races, the Caucasian white, Mongolian yellow, and the Ethiopian black. He rated each for the beauty or ugliness of the skull and quality of their civilizations. Cuvier wrote about Caucasians, "...the white race, with oval face, straight hair and nose, to which the civilized people of Europe belong and which appear to us the most beautiful of all, is also superior to others by its genius, courage and activity." Regarding Negroes, Cuvier wrote, The Negro race is marked by black complexion, crisped or woolly hair, compressed cranium and a flat nose. The projection of the lower parts of the face, and the thick lips, evidently approximate it to the monkey tribe, the hordes of which it consists have always remained in the most complete state of barbarism. He thought Adam and Eve were Caucasian and hence the original race of mankind. The other two races arose by survivors escaping in different directions after a major catastrophe hit the Earth 5,000 years ago. He theorized that the survivors lived in complete isolation from each other and developed separately. One of Cuvier's pupils, Friedrich Tiedemann, was one of the first to make a scientific contestation of racism. He argued based on craniometric and brain measurements taken by him from Europeans and black people from different parts of the world that the then common European belief that Negroes have smaller brains, and are thus intellectually inferior, is scientifically unfounded and based merely on the prejudice of travelers and explorers. <laughs> Arthur Schopenhauer. The German philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer (1788–1860) attributed civilizational primacy to the white races, who gained sensitivity and intelligence via the refinement caused by living in the rigorous northern climate. The highest civilization and culture, apart from the ancient Hindus and Egyptians, are found exclusively among the white races, and even with many dark peoples, the ruling caste, or race, is fairer in color than the rest, and has, therefore, evidently immigrated, for example, the Brahmins, the Inca, and the rulers of the South Sea Islands. All this is due to the fact that necessity is the mother of invention, because those tribes that emigrated early to the north, and there gradually became white, had to develop all their intellectual powers, and invent and perfect all the arts in their struggle with need, want, and misery, which, in their many forms, were brought about by the climate. This they had to do in order to make up for the parsimony of nature, and out of it all came their high civilization. Topic. Franz Ignaz Pruner Franz Ignaz Pruner was a medical doctor who studied the racial structure of Negroes in Egypt. In a book which he wrote in 1846 he claimed that Negro blood had a negative influence on the Egyptian moral character. He published a monograph on Negroes in 1861. He claimed that the main feature of the Negro's skeleton is prognathism, which he claimed was the Negro's relation to the ape. He also claimed that Negroes had very similar brains to apes and that Negroes have a shortened big toe, which is a characteristic connecting Negroes closely to apes. Racial theories in physical anthropology, 1850–1918 The scientific classification established by Carl Linnaeus is requisite to any human racial classification scheme. In the 19th century, unilineal evolution, aka classical social evolution, was a conflation of competing sociologic and anthropologic theories proposing that Western European culture was the acme of human socio-cultural evolution. The proposal that social status is unilineal from primitive to civilized, from agricultural to industrial, became popular among philosophers, including Friedrich Hegel, Immanuel Kant, and Auguste Comte. 
The Christian Bible was interpreted to sanction slavery and from the 1820s to the 1850s was often used in the antebellum southern United States, by writers such as the Reverend Richard Furman and Thomas R. Cobb, to enforce the idea that Negroes had been created inferior, and thus suited to slavery. <laughs> Charles Darwin Charles Darwin's influential 1859 book On the Origin of Species did not discuss human origins. The extended wording on the title page, which adds by means of natural selection, or the preservation of favored races in the struggle for life, uses the general term, races, as an alternative for varieties, and does not carry the modern connotation of human races. The first use in the book refers to the several races, for instance, of the cabbage, and proceeds to a discussion of the hereditary varieties or races of our domestic animals and plants. In The Descent of Man, and Selection in Relation to Sex, 1871, Darwin examined the question of arguments in favor of, and opposed to, ranking the so called races of man as distinct species and reported no racial distinctions that would indicate that human races are discrete species. It may be doubted whether any character can be named, which is distinctive of a race and is constant. They graduate into each other, and it is hardly possible to discover clear, distinctive characters between them. As it is improbable that the numerous, and unimportant, points of resemblance, between the several races of man, in bodily structure and mental faculties I do not here refer to similar customs should all have been independently acquired, they must have been inherited from progenitors who had these same characters. Richard Weikart, in his book From Darwin to Hitler, Evolutionary Ethics, Eugenics and Racism in Germany 2004, claims, Darwin clearly believed that the struggle for existence among humans would result in racial extermination. In Descent of Man he asserted, "...at some future period, not very distant as measured by centuries, the civilized races of man will almost certainly exterminate and replace throughout the world the savage races." According to Talk, Origins, this is a common creationist quote mine. They argue that when Darwin referred to race, he meant varieties, not human races, as per the cabbage example cited above. Apart from the plain meaning of the words, they assert, there is nothing in Darwin's words to support and much in his life to contradict any claim that Darwin wanted the lower or savage races to be exterminated. He was merely noting what appeared to him to be factual, based in no small part on the evidence of a European binge of imperialism and colonial conquest during his lifetime." The quoted passage, in full context, reads, The great break in the organic chain between man and his nearest allies, which cannot be bridged over by any extinct or living species, has often been advanced as a grave objection to the belief that man is descended from some lower form, but this objection will not appear of much weight to those who, from general reasons, believe in the general principle of evolution. Breaks often occur in all parts of the series, some being wide, sharp and defined, others less so in various degrees, as between the orang and its nearest allies—between the tarsius and the other lemuridae between the elephant, and in a more striking manner between the ornithorhynchus or echidna, and all other mammals. But these breaks depend merely on the number of related forms which have become extinct. At some future period, not very distant as measured by centuries, the civilized races of man will almost certainly exterminate, and replace, the savage races throughout the world. At the same time the anthropomorphous apes, as Professor Schaffhausen has remarked, will no doubt be exterminated. The break between man and his nearest allies will then be wider, for it will intervene between man in a more civilized state, as we may hope, even than the Caucasian, and some ape as low as a baboon, instead of as now between the Negro or Australian and the gorilla. In the chapter, On the Development of the Intellectual and Moral Faculties During Primeval and Civilized Times, 
Darwin claimed that the Western nations of Europe, who now so immeasurably surpass their former savage progenitors, and stand at the summit of civilization, owe little or none of their superiority to direct inheritance from the old Greeks." While proposing a sole human species, Darwin contrasted the "...civilized races," with the "...savage races." Like most of his contemporaries, except the naturalist Alfred Russell Wallace, he did not distinguish «biological race» from «cultural race». Moreover, he noted that savage races risked extinction more from white European colonialism than from evolutionary inadequacy. On the question of differences between races, Darwin wrote, there is, however, no doubt that the various races, when carefully compared and measured, differ much from each other. As in the texture of the hair, the relative proportions of all parts of the body, the capacity of the lungs, the form and capacity of the skull, and even in the convolutions of the brain. But it would be an endless task to specify the numerous points of structural difference. The races differ also in constitution, in acclimatization, and in liability to certain diseases. Their mental characteristics are likewise very distinct, chiefly as it would appear in their emotional, but partly in their intellectual, faculties. Everyone who has had the opportunity of comparison, must have been struck with the contrast between the taciturn, even morose, aborigines of S. America and the light-hearted, talkative Negroes. There is a nearly similar contrast between the Malays and the Papuans, who live under the same physical conditions, and are separated from each other only by a narrow space of sea. <laughs> Arthur de Gobineau The French aristocrat and writer Arthur de Gobineau (1816–1882) is best known for his book and essay on the inequality of the human races (1853–55), which proposed three human races, black, white, and yellow, were natural barriers and claimed that race mixing would lead to the collapse of culture and civilization. He claimed that. The white race originally possessed the monopoly of beauty, intelligence, and strength and that any positive accomplishments or thinking of blacks and Asians were due to an admixture with whites. His works were praised by many white supremacist American pro-slavery thinkers such as Josiah C. Knott and Henry Holtz. Gobineau believed that the different races originated in different areas, the white race had originated somewhere in Siberia, the Asians in the Americas and the blacks in Africa. He believed that the white race was superior, writing, I will not wait for the Friends of Equality to show me such and such passages in books written by missionaries or sea captains, who declare some Wolof as a fine carpenter, some Hottentot a good servant, that a Kaffir dances and plays the violin, that some Bambara knows arithmetic. Let us leave aside these puerilities and compare together not men, but groups. Gobineau later used the term. Aryans, to describe the Germanic peoples, La race Germanique. Gobineau's works were also influential to the Nazi Party, which published his works in German. They played a key role in the master race theory of Nazism. Topic: <laughs> Karl Vogt. Another polygenist evolutionist was Karl Vogt who believed that the Negro race was related to the ape. He wrote the white race was a separate species to Negroes. In Chapter 7 of his Lectures of Man 1864, he compared the Negro to the white race whom he described as, two extreme human types. The difference between them, he claimed are greater than those between two species of ape, and this proves that Negroes are a separate species from the whites. <laughs> Herbert Hope Risley As an exponent of race science, colonial administrator Herbert Hope Risley (1851–1911) used the ratio of the width of a nose to its height to divide Indian people into Aryan and Dravidian races, as well as seven castes. Topic: <laughs> Ernst Haeckel. 
Like most of Darwin's supporters, Ernst Haeckel (1834–1919) put forward a doctrine of evolutionary polygenism based on the ideas of the linguist and polygenist August Schleicher, in which several different language groups had arisen separately from speechless prehuman Ermenschen (German for original humans), which themselves had evolved from simian ancestors. These separate languages had completed the transition from animals to man, and, under the influence of each main branch of languages, humans had evolved as separate species, which could be subdivided into races. Haeckel divided human beings into ten races, of which the Caucasian was the highest and the primitives were doomed to extinction. Haeckel was also an advocate of the out of Asia theory by writing that the origin of humanity was to be found in Asia. He believed that Hindustan South Asia was the actual location where the first humans had evolved. Haeckel argued that humans were closely related to the primates of Southeast Asia and rejected Darwin's hypothesis of Africa. Haeckel also wrote that Negroes have stronger and more freely movable toes than any other race, which is evidence that Negroes are related to apes because when apes stop climbing in trees, they hold on to the trees with their toes. Haeckel compared Negroes to four handed apes. Haeckel also believed Negroes were savages and that whites were the most civilized. <laughs> Nationalism, de la Pauge and Herder At the 19th century's end, scientific racism conflated Greco-Roman eugenicism with Francis Galton's concept of voluntary eugenics to produce a form of coercive, anti-immigrant government programs influenced by other socio-political discourses and events. Such institutional racism was effected via phrenology, telling character from physiognomy, craniometric skull and skeleton studies, thus skulls and skeletons of black people and other colored volk, were displayed between apes and white men. In 1906, Oda Benga, a pygmy, was displayed as the missing link in the Bronx Zoo, New York City, alongside apes and animals. The most influential theorists included the anthropologist Georges Vachet de la Pauge (1854–1936), who proposed anthroposociology, and Johann Gottfried Herder (1744–1803), who applied race to nationalist theory, thereby developing the first conception of ethnic nationalism. In 1882, Ernest Renan contradicted Herder with a nationalism based upon the will to live together, not founded upon ethnic or racial prerequisites. Scientific racist discourse posited the historical existence of national races, such as the Deutsche Volk in Germany, and the French race, being a branch of the basal Aryan race extant for millennia, to advocate for geopolitical borders parallel to the racial ones. <laughs> Craniometry and physical anthropology The Dutch scholar Peter Camper (1722–89), an early craniometric theoretician, used «craniometry» interior skull volume measurement to scientifically justify racial differences. In 1770, he conceived of the facial angle to measure intelligence among species of men. The facial angle was formed by drawing two lines, a horizontal line from nostril to ear, and a vertical line from the upper jawbone prominence to the forehead prominence. Camper's craniometry reported that antique statues the Greco-Roman ideal had a 90-degree facial angle, whites an 80-degree angle, blacks a 70-degree angle, and the orangutan a 58-degree facial angle. Thus he established a racist biological hierarchy for mankind, per the decadent conception of history. Such scientific racist researches were continued by the naturalist Étienne Geoffroy Saint Hilaire (1772–1844) and the anthropologist Paul Broca (1824–1880). Topic: Samuel George Morton. 
In the 19th century, an early American physical anthropologist, physician and polygenist Samuel George Morton (1799–1851) collected human skulls from worldwide and attempted a logical classification scheme. Influenced by contemporary racialist theory, Dr. Morton said he could judge racial intellectual capacity by measuring the interior cranial capacity, hence a large skull denoted a large brain, thus high intellectual capacity. Conversely, a small skull denoted a small brain, thus low intellectual capacity, superior and inferior established. After inspecting three mummies from ancient Egyptian catacombs, Morton concluded that Caucasians and Negroes were already distinct 3,000 years ago. Since the Bible indicated that Noah's Ark had washed up on Mount Ararat only a thousand years earlier, Morton claimed that Noah's sons could not possibly account for every race on Earth. According to Morton's theory of polygenesis, races have been separate since the start. In Morton's Crania Americana, his claims were based on craniometry data that the Caucasians had the biggest brains, averaging 87 cubic inches, Native Americans were in the middle with an average of 82 cubic inches, and Negroes had the smallest brains with an average of 78 cubic inches. In The Mismeasure of Man, 1981, the historian of science Stephen J. Gould argued that Sam Samuel Morton had falsified the craniometric data, perhaps inadvertently over packing some skulls, to so produce results that would legitimize the racist presumptions he was attempting to prove. A subsequent study by the anthropologist John Michael found Morton's original data to be more accurate than Gould describes, concluding that, C. Contrary to Gould's interpretation, Morton's research was conducted with integrity. Jason Lewis and colleagues reached similar conclusions as Michael in their reanalysis of Morton's skull collection, however, they depart from Morton's racist conclusions by adding that, "...studies have demonstrated that modern human variation is generally continuous, rather than discrete or racial, and that most variation in modern humans is within, rather than between, populations." In 1873, Paul Broca, founder of the Anthropological Society of Paris 1859, found the same pattern of measures—that Crania Americana reported—by weighing specimen brains at autopsy. Other historical studies, proposing a black race white race, intelligence brain size difference, include those by Bean, 1906, Mall, 1909, Pearl, 1934, and Vint. 1934. Topic. Nicholas Palacios After the War of the Pacific 1879 there was a rise of racial and national superiority ideas among the Chilean ruling class. In his 1918 book Physician Nicholas Palacios argued for the existence of Chilean race and its superiority when compared to neighboring peoples. He thought Chileans were a mix of two martial races, the indigenous Mapuches and the Visigoths of Spain, who descended ultimately from Gotaland in Sweden. Palacios argued on medical grounds against immigration to Chile from southern Europe claiming that mestizos who are of South European stock lack cerebral control and are a social burden. Monogenism and polygenism Samuel Morton's followers, especially Dr. Josiah C. Knott and George Glidden extended Dr. Morton's ideas in Types of Mankind 1854, claiming that Morton's findings supported the notion of polygenism. Mankind has discrete genetic ancestries, the races are evolutionarily unrelated, and is predecessor of the modern human multiregional origin hypothesis. Moreover, Morton himself had been reluctant to espouse polygenism, because it theologically challenged the Christian creation myth espoused in the Bible. Later, in The Descent of Man 1871, Charles Darwin proposed the single-origin hypothesis, i.e., monogenism. 
mankind has a common genetic ancestry, the races are related, opposing everything that the polygenism of Knott and Glidden proposed. Topic: <laughs> Topologies. One of the first topologies used to classify various human races was invented by Georges Vachet de Lepauge 1854 to 1936, a theoretician of eugenics, who published in 1899 Larian et son role social 1899, the Aryan and his social role. In this book, he classified humanity into various hierarchized races, spanning from the Aryan white race, Dalacocephalic, to the brachycephalic, mediocre and inert race, best represented by Southern European, Catholic peasants. Between these, Vache de la Pauge identified the Homo Europaeus, Teutonic, Protestant, etc., the Homo Alpinus. Overnat, Turkish, etc., and finally the Homo Mediterraneus, Neapolitan, Andalus, etc. Jews were brachycephalic like the Aryans, according to Le Pauge, but exactly for this reason he considered them to be dangerous. They were the only group, he thought, threatening to displace the Aryan aristocracy. Vache de la Pauge became one of the leading inspirators of Nazi antisemitism and Nazi racist ideology. Vache de la Pouge's classification was mirrored in William Z. Ripley in The Races of Europe, 1899, a book which had a large influence on American white supremacism. Ripley even made a map of Europe according to the alleged cephalic index of its inhabitants. He was an important influence of the American eugenist Madison Grant. Furthermore, according to John Efron of Indiana University, the late 19th century also witnessed the scientizing of anti-Jewish prejudice, stigmatizing Jews with male menstruation, pathological hysteria, and nymphomania. At the same time, several Jews, such as Joseph Jacobs or Samuel Weissenberg, also endorsed the same pseudoscientific theories, convinced that the Jews formed a distinct race. Chaim Zhitlovsky also attempted to define Yiddishkeit Ashkenazi Jewishness by turning to contemporary racial theory. Joseph Deniker (1852–1918) was one of William Z. Ripley's principal opponents, whereas Ripley maintained, as did Vache de la Pauge, that the European populace comprised three races. Joseph Deniker proposed that the European populace comprised ten races, six primary and four sub-races. Furthermore, he proposed that the concept of race was ambiguous, and in its stead proposed the compound word ethnic group, which later prominently featured in the works of Julian Huxley and Alfred C. Haddon. Moreover, Ripley argued that Deniker's race idea should be denoted a type because it was less biologically rigid than most racial classifications. Topic. Ideological applications Topic. Nordicism Joseph Deniker's contribution to racist theory was La race nordique the Nordic race, a generic, racial stock descriptor, which the American eugenicist Madison Grant presented as the white racial engine of world civilization. Having adopted Ripley's three-race European populace model, but disliking the Teuton race name, he transliterated La race nordique into the Nordic race. The acme of the concocted racial hierarchy, based upon his racial classification theory, popular in the 1910s and 1920s. Staten's Institute for Rasbiologi and its director Hermann Lundborg in Sweden were active in racist research. Furthermore, much of early research on Ural Altaic languages was coloured by attempts at justifying the view that European peoples east of Sweden were Asian and thus of inferior race, justifying colonialism, eugenics, and racial hygiene. Topic: <laughs> Justification of slavery in the U.S. 
In the United States, scientific racism justified black African slavery to assuage moral opposition to the Atlantic slave trade. Alexander Thomas and Samuel Sillen described black men as uniquely fitted for bondage, because of their primitive psychological organization. In 1851, in Antebellum, Louisiana, the physician Samuel A. Cartwright wrote of slave escape attempts as drapetomania, a treatable mental illness, that, with proper medical advice, strictly followed, this troublesome practice that many Negroes have of running away can be almost entirely prevented. The term drapetomania mania of the runaway slave derives from the Greek drapates drapes, a runaway slave, and mania mania, madness, frenzy. Cartwright also described dysesthesia ethiopica, called rascality, by overseers. The 1840 United States Census claimed that northern, free blacks suffered mental illness at higher rates than did their southern, enslaved counterparts. Though the census was later found to have been severely flawed by the American Statistical Association, to John Quincy Adams and others it became a political weapon against abolitionists. Southern slavers concluded that escaping Negroes were suffering from "...mental disorders." At the time of the American Civil War 1861 the matter of miscegenation prompted studies of ostensible physiological differences between Caucasians and Negroes. Early anthropologists, such as Josiah Clark Knott, George Robbins Glidden, Robert Knox, and Samuel George Morton, aimed to scientifically prove that Negroes were a human species different from the white people species, that the rulers of ancient Egypt were not African, and that mixed-race offspring the product of miscegenation tended to physical weakness and infertility. After the Civil War, Southern Confederacy physicians wrote textbooks of scientific racism based upon studies claiming that black freemen ex-slaves were becoming extinct, because they were inadequate to the demands of being a free man—implying that black people benefited from enslavement. In Medical Apartheid, Harriet A. Washington noted the prevalence of two different views on blacks in the 19th century, the belief that they were inferior and riddled with imperfections from head to toe", and the idea that they didn't know true pain and suffering because of their primitive nervous systems and that slavery was therefore justifiable. Washington noted the failure of scientists to accept the inconsistency between these two viewpoints, writing that in the 18th and 19th centuries, scientific racism was simply science, and it was promulgated by the very best minds at the most prestigious institutions of the nation. Other, more logical medical theories stressed the equality of Africans and laid poor black health at the feet of their abusers, but these never enjoyed the appeal of the medical philosophy that justified slavery and, along with it, our nation's profitable way of life. Even after the end of the Civil War, some scientists continued to justify the institution of slavery by citing the effect of topography and climate on racial development. Nathaniel Shaler, a prominent geologist at Harvard University from 1869 to 1906, published the book Man and the Earth in 1905 describing the physical geography of different continents and linking these geologic settings to the intelligence and strength of human races that inhabited these spaces. Shaler argued that North American climate and geology was ideally suited for the institution of slavery. South African apartheid Scientific racism played a role in establishing apartheid in South Africa. In South Africa, white scientists, like Dudley Kidd, who published The Essential Kaffir in 1904, sought to «understand the African mind». They believed that the cultural differences between whites and blacks in South Africa might be caused by physiological differences in the brain. Rather than suggesting that Africans were overgrown children, as early white explorers had, Kidd believed that Africans were misgrown with a vengeance. He described Africans as at once hopelessly deficient, yet very shrewd, 
The Carnegie Commission on the Poor White Problem in South Africa played a key role in establishing apartheid in South Africa. According to one memorandum sent to Frederick Keppel, then president of the Carnegie Corporation, there was little doubt that if the natives were given full economic opportunity, the more competent among them would soon outstrip the less competent whites. Keppel's support for the project of creating the report was motivated by his concern with the maintenance of existing racial boundaries. The preoccupation of the Carnegie Corporation with the so-called poor white problem in South Africa was at least in part the outcome of similar misgivings about the state of poor whites in the southern United States. The report was five volumes in length. Around the start of the 20th century, white Americans, and whites elsewhere in the world, felt uneasy because poverty and economic depression seemed to strike people regardless of race. Though the groundwork for apartheid began earlier, the report provided support for this central idea of black inferiority. This was used to justify racial segregation and discrimination in the following decades. The report expressed fear about the loss of white racial pride, and in particular pointed to the danger that the poor white would not be able to resist the process of «Africanization». Although scientific racism played a role in justifying and supporting institutional racism in South Africa, it was not as important in South Africa as it has been in Europe and the United States. This was due in part to the «poor white problem» which raised serious questions for supremacists about white racial superiority. Since poor whites were found to be in the same situation as natives in the African environment, the idea that intrinsic white superiority could overcome any environment did not seem to hold. As such, scientific justifications for racism were not as useful in South Africa. Eugenics Stephen Jay Gould described Madison Grant's The Passing of the Great Race 1916 as, "...the most influential tract of American scientific racism." In the 1920s–30s, the German racial hygiene movement embraced Grant's Nordic theory. Alfred Pletz (1860–1940) coined the term Rassenhygiene in Racial Hygiene Basics (1895) and founded the German Society for Racial Hygiene in 1905. The movement advocated selective breeding, compulsory sterilization, and a close alignment of public health with eugenics. Racial hygiene was historically tied to traditional notions of public health, but with emphasis on heredity what philosopher and historian Michel Foucault has called state racism. In 1869, Francis Galton proposed the first social measures meant to preserve or enhance biological characteristics, and later coined the term, eugenics. Galton, a statistician, introduced correlation and regression analysis and discovered regression toward the mean. He was also the first to study human differences and inheritance of intelligence with statistical methods. He introduced the use of questionnaires and surveys to collect data on population sets, which he needed for genealogical and biographical works and for anthropometric studies. Galton also founded psychometrics, the science of measuring mental faculties, and differential psychology, a branch of psychology concerned with psychological differences between people rather than common traits. Like scientific racism, eugenics grew popular in the early 20th century, and both ideas influenced Nazi racial policies and Nazi eugenics. In 1901 Galton, Carl Pearson 1857 and Walter F. R. Weldon 1860 founded the Biometrica Scientific Journal, which promoted biometrics and statistical analysis of heredity. Charles Davenport 1866 was briefly involved in the review. In Race Crossing in Jamaica 1929, he made statistical arguments that biological and cultural degradation followed white and black interbreeding. Davenport was connected to Nazi Germany before and during World War II. 
In 1939 he wrote a contribution to the Festschrift for Otto Rech 1879-1966, who became an important figure within the plan to remove populations considered «inferior» from eastern Germany. <laughs> Interbellum to World War II Scientific racism continued through the early 20th century, and soon intelligence testing became a new source for racial comparisons. Before World War II scientific racism remained common to anthropology, and was used as justification for eugenics programs, compulsory sterilization, anti-miscegenation laws, and immigration restrictions in Europe and the United States. The War Crimes and Crimes Against Humanity of Nazi Germany 1933 discredited scientific racism in academia, but racist legislation based upon it remained in some countries until the late 1960s. <laughs> Early intelligence testing and the Immigration Act of 1924 Before the 1920s, social scientists agreed that whites were superior to blacks, but they needed a way to prove this in order to back social policy in favor of whites. They felt the best way to gauge this was through testing intelligence. By interpreting the tests to show favor to whites these test makers' research results portrayed all minority groups very negatively. In 1908, Henry Goddard translated the Binet intelligence test from French and in 1912 began to apply the test to incoming immigrants on Ellis Island. Some claim that in a study of immigrants Goddard reached the conclusion that 87% of Russians, 83% of Jews, 80% of Hungarians, and 79% of Italians were feeble-minded and had a mental age less than 12. Some have also claimed that this information was taken as «evidence» by lawmakers and thus it affected social policy for years. Bernard Davis has pointed out that, in the first sentence of his paper, Goddard wrote that the subjects of the study were not typical members of their groups but were selected because of their suspected sub-normal intelligence. Davis has further noted that Goddard argued that the low IQs of the test subjects were more likely due to environmental rather than genetic factors, and that Goddard concluded that, "...we may be confident that their children will be of average intelligence and if rightly brought up will be good citizens." In 1996 the American Psychological Association's Board of Scientific Affairs stated that IQ tests were not discriminatory towards any ethnic, racial groups. In his book The Mismeasure of Man, Stephen Jay Gould argued that intelligence testing results played a major role in the passage of the Immigration Act of 1924 that restricted immigration to the United States. However, Mark Snyderman and Richard J. Hernstein, after studying the congressional record and committee hearings related to the Immigration Act, concluded, "...the intelligence testing community did not generally view its findings as favoring restrictive immigration policies like those in the 1924 Act, and Congress took virtually no notice of intelligence testing." Juan N. Franco contested the findings of Snyderman and Hernstein. Franco stated that even though Snyderman and Hernstein reported that the data collected from the results of the intelligence tests were in no way used to pass the Immigration Act of 1924, the IQ test results were still taken into consideration by legislators. As suggestive evidence, Franco pointed to the following fact, following the passage of the Immigration Act, information from the 1890 census was used to set quotas based on percentages of immigrants coming from different countries. Based on these data, the legislature restricted the entrance of immigrants from Southern and Eastern Europe into the United States and allowed more immigrants from Northern and Western Europe into the country. 
The use of the 1900, 1910 or 1920 census data sets would have resulted in larger numbers of immigrants from Southern and Eastern Europe being allowed into the U.S. However, Franco pointed out that using the 1890 census data allowed Congress to exclude Southern and Eastern Europeans who performed worse on IQ tests of the time than did Western and Northern Europeans from the U.S. Franco argued that the work Snyderman and Hernstein conducted on this matter neither proved or disproved that intelligence testing influenced immigration laws. Sweden Following the creation of the first Society for the Promotion of Racial Hygiene, the German Society for Racial Hygiene in 1905, a Swedish society was founded in 1909 as as third in the world. By lobbying Swedish parliamentarians and medical institutes the society managed to pass a decree creating a government-run institute in the form of the Swedish State Institute of Racial Biology in 1921. By 1922 the institute was built and opened in Uppsala. It was the first such government-funded institute in the world performing research into racial biology and remains highly controversial to this day. The goal was to cure criminality, alcoholism and psychiatric problems through research in eugenics and racial hygiene. As a result of the Institute's work a law permitting compulsory sterilization of certain groups was enacted in Sweden in 1934. The second president of the Institute Gunnar Dahlberg was highly critical of the validity of the science performed at the Institute and reshaped the Institute toward a focus on genetics. In 1958 it closed down and all remaining research was moved to the Department of Medical Genetics at Uppsala University. <laughs> Nazi Germany The Nazi Party and its sympathizers published many books on scientific racism, seizing on the eugenicist and anti-Semitic ideas with which they were widely associated, although these ideas had been in circulation since the 19th century. Books such as Rassenkunde des Deutschen Volkes, Ethnology of the German People, by Hans F. K. Gunther and Rass und Seel, Race and Soul. By de, Ludwig Ferdinand Clau attempted to scientifically identify differences between the German, Nordic, or Aryan people and other, supposedly inferior, groups. German schools used these books as texts during the Nazi era. In the early 1930s, the Nazis used racialized scientific rhetoric based on social Darwinism to push its restrictive and discriminatory social policies. During World War II, Nazi racialist beliefs became anathema in the United States, and Boasians such as Ruth Benedict consolidated their institutional power. After the war, discovery of the Holocaust and Nazi abuses of scientific research such as Joseph Mengele's ethical violations and other war crimes revealed at the Nuremberg Trials led most of the scientific community to repudiate scientific support for racism. Propaganda for the Nazi eugenics program began with propaganda for eugenic sterilization. Articles in Neues Volk described the appearance of the mentally ill and the importance of preventing such births. Photographs of mentally incapacitated children were juxtaposed with those of healthy children. The film Das Erbe showed conflict in nature in order to legitimate the law for the prevention of hereditarily diseased offspring by sterilization. Although the child was the most important treasure of the people, this did not apply to all children, even German ones, only to those with no hereditary weaknesses. Nazi Germany's racially based social policies placed the improvement of the Aryan race through eugenics at the center of Nazis' ideology. Those humans were targeted who were identified as life unworthy of life. German, Lebensunwertes Leben, including but not limited to Jewish people, criminals, degenerate, dissident, feeble-minded, homosexual, idle, insane, and the weak, for elimination from the chain of heredity. Despite their still being regarded as Aryan, 
Nazi ideology deems Slavs i.e., Poles, Russians, Ukrainians, etc. to be inferior to the Germanic master race, suitable for expulsion, enslavement, or even extermination. Adolf Hitler banned intelligence quotient IQ testing for being Jewish, as did Joseph Stalin for being bourgeois. United States In the 20th century, concepts of scientific racism, which sought to prove the physical and mental inadequacy of groups deemed «inferior», was relied upon to justify involuntary sterilization programs. Such programs, promoted by eugenicists such as Harry H. Laughlin, were upheld as constitutional by the U.S. Supreme Court in Buck v. Bell 1927. In all, between 60,000 and 90,000 Americans were subjected to involuntary sterilization. Scientific racism was also used as a justification for the Emergency Quota Act of 1921 and the Immigration Act of 1924, Johnson Reed Act, which imposed racial quotas limiting Italian American immigration to the United States and immigration other Southern European and Eastern European nations. Proponents of these quotas, who sought to block undesirable immigrants, justifying restrictions by invoking scientific racism. Lothrop Stoddard published many racialist books on what he saw as the peril of immigration, his most famous being The Rising Tide of Color Against White World Supremacy in 1920. In this book he presented a view of the world situation pertaining to race focusing concern on the coming population explosion among the colored peoples of the world and the way in which white world supremacy was being lessened in the wake of World War I and the collapse of colonialism. Stoddard's analysis divided world politics and situations into white, yellow, black, Amerindian, and brown peoples and their interactions. Stoddard argued race and heredity were the guiding factors of history and civilization, and that the elimination or absorption of the white race by colored races would result in the destruction of Western civilization. Like Madison Grant, Stoddard divided the white race into three main divisions, Nordic, Alpine, and Mediterranean. He considered all three to be of good stock, and far above the quality of the colored races, but argued that the Nordic was the greatest of the three and needed to be preserved by way of eugenics. Unlike Grant, Stoddard was less concerned with which varieties of European people were superior to others Nordic theory, but was more concerned with what he called biracialism, seeing the world as being composed of simply colored and white races. In the years after the Great Migration and World War I, Grant's racial theory would fall out of favor in the U.S. in favor of a model closer to Stoddard's. An influential publication was The Races of Europe, 1939, by Carlton S. Kuhn, president of the American Association of Physical Anthropologists from 1930 to 1961. Kuhn was a proponent of multiregional origin of modern humans. He divided Homo sapiens into five main races. Kuhn's school of thought was the object of increasing opposition in mainstream anthropology after World War II. Ashley Montague was particularly vocal in denouncing Kuhn, especially in his man's most dangerous myth, The Fallacy of Race. By the 1960s, Kuhn's approach had been rendered obsolete in mainstream anthropology, but his system continued to appear in publications by his student John Lawrence Angel as late as in the 1970s. In the late 19th century, the Plessy v. Ferguson 1896 United States Supreme Court decision—which upheld the constitutional legality of racial segregation under the doctrine of separate but equal was intellectually rooted in the racism of the era, as was the popular support for the decision. Later, in the mid-20th century, the Supreme Court's Brown v. Board of Education of Topeka 1954 decision rejected racialist arguments about the need for racial segregation, especially in public schools. Topic. 
After 1945 By 1954, 58 years after the Plessy v. Ferguson upholding of racial segregation in the United States, American popular and scholarly opinions of scientific racism and its sociologic practice had evolved. In 1960 the journal Mankind Quarterly started, which some have described as a venue for scientific racism. It has been criticized for a claimed ideological bias, and for lacking a legitimate scholarly purpose. The journal was founded in 1960, partly in response to the Supreme Court decision Brown v. Board of Education, which desegregated the American public school system. In April 1966, Alex Haley interviewed American Nazi Party founder George Lincoln Rockwell for Playboy. Rockwell justified his belief that blacks were inferior to whites by citing a long 1916 study by G.O. Ferguson which claimed to show that the intellectual performance of black students was correlated with their percentage of white ancestry, stating, "...pure Negroes, Negroes three-fourths pure, mulattoes and quadroons have, roughly, 60, 70, 80 and 90 percent, respectively, of white intellectual efficiency." Playboy later published the interview with an editorial note claiming the study was a discredited pseudoscientific rationale for racism. International bodies such as UNESCO attempted to draft resolutions that would summarize the state of scientific knowledge about race and issued calls for the resolution of racial conflicts. In its 1950 The Race Question, UNESCO did not reject the idea of a biological basis to racial categories, but instead defined a race as, "...a race, from the biological standpoint, may therefore be defined as one of the group of populations constituting the species Homo sapiens." which were broadly defined as the Caucasian, Mongoloid, Negroid races but stated that, it is now generally recognized that intelligence tests do not in themselves enable us to differentiate safely between what is due to innate capacity and what is the result of environmental influences, training and education." Today, the term, "...scientific racism," may be used by some to refer to research seeming to scientifically justify racist ideology. Contemporary researchers and authors include the late Arthur Jensen, The G Factor, The Science of Mental Ability, the late J. Philippe Rushton, president of the Pioneer Fund, Race, Evolution, and Behavior, the late Chris Brand, The G Factor, General Intelligence and Its Implications, Richard Lynn, IQ and the Wealth of Nations, Charles Murray and the late Richard Herrnstein, The Bell Curve, and Nicholas Wade, A Troublesome Inheritance, among others. These authors themselves, while seeing their work as scientific, may dispute the term racism and may prefer terms such as race realism or racialism. <laughs> See also